Welcome to the Startup Grind. Uh, my name is Laura Porter. Uh, I um, work very honored to work at the USC Columbia Technology Incubator with a great group of people. Um, Speedtree, or IDV, was one of the very first companies to come through the program, and uh, they've just obviously, from you've seen, grown and blossomed from there. So without further ado, I give you both of them. My name is Dirk Brown. I'm the uh, director of the Faber Entrepreneurship Center at the Moore School. Uh, I have a pleasure of interviewing tonight Chris King, South Carolina native, uh, Lexington High School, is that right? And, uh, and then USC College of Engineering and Computing, uh, bachelor's and master's, I think, is that right? And, uh, and then co-founder of IDV in 1999. Um, so Chris, let me dive in and um, ask you about IDV. Can you just give us a quick overview of the company and then I'll ask you the more uh, intimate questions after that. Sure. Um, IDV makes a virtual vegetation product called Speedtree, and it's our flagship product. Um, and so we, we start off in, in video games, and uh, it was a very important for us to, to get established there. Um, and we, we had a background that was really strong in, in real-time programming, and so uh, in graphics. So we did that, and then in 2009, we branched out, um, pun intended, to uh, cinematic effects, and our, our first movie was uh, Avatar. And then we now have um, over a thousand games to our credit, and um, about 44, 45 films. That's a great. That's a great story. And so, Speedtree is your. So you really um, are well known for Speedtree. That the name of the company is IDV, but the Speedtree is sort of your flagship product. So when you started the company, was that what you planned to do? Is get into the digital tree business? Not even close. Okay. Um, in fact, IDV stands for Interactive Data Visualization, which sounds nothing like you do trees for them, and that's because we didn't intend to do that. When we started the company, we um, our expertise was in taking data in from various engineering simulations and turning that into animated graphics of, of some kind. Um, so interactive data visualization, and, and so that was how the whole thing was. I'm sorry, yeah, no, no worries. And so uh, uh, to, to be able to, to, to make that transition, uh, we, we started doing a lot of DOD work, we did some SBIR work, and when we had that money coming in, uh, we took a chance on this on this So D product. DOD being Department of Defense I'm and sorry, SBIR, yes. small yes. business law. So I'm gonna ask you, um, hold that thought for, for a minute. Sure. I'm gonna ask you about that uh, SBIR in okay. a minute, but, but keep going, please. Yeah, yes. so, and then we took a chance on the speed tree thing, and, and it ended up being just such a small part of our revenue, but opportunities kept coming, and they kept coming, and we said, you know, this might be something, and it became 10% of our revenue, 30% of our revenue, and finally it was, you know, oh, golly, we're making most of our money through this. Um, but we were splitting our time, and, it, and, it, and, a, and a product was suffering because of that. So we uh, took a plunge, killed all of our DOD work, and said we're going to be doing speed tree full time now and having a buddy. That's great. That's a great story. So, what um, I got to ask you, what percentage of the digital tree market do you think? Speed tree commands. That's an excellent question. Um, we, when we applied for our Academy Award, we found out there were actually eight other digital vegetation solutions that we were competing against, and uh, we never would have guessed that there were that many. And we've all, people ask me what I do for a living, don't live around here, and I feel ridiculous telling them I make trees for a living, and they're like, what do you, you mean you plant them? And more precisely, and then, digital vegetation well, right. solutions, right? Okay. Digital vegetation solutions is an awkward phrase when you're talking at the gas station or whatnot. So you know, <laughs> you tend to say, yeah, I make fake trees, That's and, hilarious. and so they're like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> Son, you're not from around here, are you? And I said, no, actually, I was born right here, but um, we we so we do that, and you know, our our job is, is so ridiculously niche that, that we were stunned to find out that there were eight other companies that did it. What, what percentage do we have? Um, I, will, I will say, I will hazard a guess that it's a majority and, and leave it at that. Okay, that's good. That's a good answer. Uh, so so you're, you're selling digital trees around the world. I'm sorry, um, digital vegetation solutions, right? Because it's not just trees. You do bushes, you do shrubs, you've expanded grass, your business. Grass, all that stuff. And, uh, and you're selling this around the world out of uh, your offices are in, in Lexington above a bank. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a small group of you, but from what I understand, you pretty much own the digital vegetation marketplace. At least that's what the, um, uh, that's what the Academy Award Committee seems to have thought. So, tell, so you've won a big award recently. Can you tell us about oh, that? Sure, sure. Um, uh, the, the Academy Award, it was, a, it was a technical achievement uh, Academy Award. Um, and so the way that process worked, 
Uh, and, then, and, I, and I made a joke earlier, but the joke is we're too nerdy and we're too ugly to be invited to the actual Oscars. So they have a, a separate ceremony just for you know the geeks. <laughs> and and that was that was too too. Is there a special support. name for the geek award? Is I, it um, I've heard it referred to the winner of uh, as the winner Olympics for geeks. Uh, so that was what one of the winners has, has, has called it before and referred to it as. I'm looking around. And I'm thinking some of these people are saying, "Well, that's the one I want to go to." Yeah, so right. Gonna... <laughs> that's why they use terms like voxel and, and you know, <laughs> database and, and what have you. But um, yeah, so we were at that ceremony, which was in Beverly Hills. It was a Beverly Wilshire Hotel. It was a very big deal. It was black tie. Um, and so we were honored to go for people like us, the engineers in the industry, it's, it's the pinnacle of achievement. You know, we're never going to get best actor or best director, but daggone, we can get you know, some, some technology that makes, that's made an impact. So you, so you, so you, won, uh, you won an Academy Award at the most recent Oscars. It's a, that's a pretty impressive feat. So it turns out, um, I thought that was pretty impressive when I found out about that. And um, so being a professor and hanging out with my academic colleagues, uh, it turns out Richard Robinson actually went and did some research because that's what we do at the university. So I just want to put this in perspective. Um, let me pull out my research notes. Uh, it turns out, um, well, as you know, USC was founded in 1801, right? Uh, hundreds of thousands of students have come through USC. So let's think about how many of them may have won Academy Awards. So Richard Robinson went off and did some research along with our library staff, extensively researching all, thousands, all hundreds of thousands of students to see who has won an Academy Award uh, in the history of USC. Well, it turns out, for those of you who've seen Singing in the Rain with Gene Kelly, uh, the director of that was Stanley Donan, as you probably know, South Carolina native, uh, was nominated for an Academy Award, but did not win. Uh, and then um, in 1989, many years later, uh, he, won an, uh, got an, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from USC, and then won an, honorary, um, an, an Academy Honorary Award in uh, 1998. So we have that legacy at USC. Um, the USC Poet Laureate and Professor from 1969 to 1997, James Dickey, uh, was nominated for Best Screenplay for that film you probably all know, Deliverance, uh, in 1973, but again, didn't win. So we have a few nominations, but no wins so far. Uh, by the way, Deliverance was also nominated for Best Picture in, 19, uh, in 1973, and again, did not win. Um, two other USC graduates, Cliff Hollingsworth uh, and Alex Daniels, both have gone on to much recognition and awarded accomplishment, uh, but neither of them have ever been uh, nominated for an Academy Award. So we have very few folks nominated for Academy Awards. Um, Cliff was a screenplay writer and Alex was a stuntman. Um, so we're, we, we were really uh, digging to see who else, uh, who in the history of USC has won an Academy Award. So you know what we found out, Chris? Just Are you, are you waiting to hear the answer to this? I am all ears. The bottom line, at one of the oldest universities in America with a deep history in the arts and in engineering, right? And you won the Geek Award, so you'd be That's curious about that. Um, the only graduates or professors that have ever received an Academy Award are Chris King, Michael Stuggy Christ, and Greg Kropp. So the three of you are the only ones to have ever won an Academy Award in the history of USC. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> So I gotta, I gotta ask you. So what? So, so you're the one person, or you're one of three people, I should say, that I can ask. So what was the award ceremony like? Wow, that guy sounds a lot more interesting than me. We should bring him up here because I mean that is overwhelming. I, I, you know, you mentioned Richard, Richard Robinson. If I might go away from that question a little bit, I wanted to. to Richard is a professor here, taught entrepreneurship, uh, a business professor. Uh, he was with us from the very, very beginning. He helped us found the company, and he was always that voice in our head, Michael, and when Michael and I started the company. That voice in our head going, there's more to running a business than coding. There's more than coding. More than, and we were just like, come on, that's, you know, that if we don't have a product, nobody's going to come. So uh, he's been absolutely crucial to, to keep us on task, to keep us doing what we need to be doing. Uh, so, you know, we owe Richard Robinson a great deal. Uh, also, here is Kevin Meredith, who's been, who sold the very first copy of Speech He's our marketing director. He is an MBA graduate from USC. So, there's another USC fellow there. Uh, the guy that I started the company with is here, Michael Seacrest. He's the, one of the other Academy Award winners. Uh, he's a USC computer engineering graduate, one year behind me. And then finally, the third award winner is a USC computer engineering graduate that was in one of my classes when I was an adjunct professor. So, very, very strong USC contingent. We're proud Gamecocks, uh, as you saw in, in our acceptance speech. So, uh, that was a big deal. But anyway, all right, so to talk about the Academy Awards, because it really was a unique experience for us. And I've already talked about Kevin. I want to give another shout out to him. It was Kevin's idea for us to apply for the technical awards, and, and that's how it's done. You apply for it, uh, which we didn't know. And he's like, hey, let's apply for Academy Award. And we're like, 
get out of here, we got work to do. You know, we, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. We're not gonna apply for an Academy Award, we do video games. You know, but we did have some, some movies under our belts. And he's like, no, 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 if the application is huge, but I'll do 90% of it, if you guys will just come in and, and do some of the technical stuff, um, you know, it'd be great. And he said, oh, you know, whatever, waste your time, go ahead. And so he did, and then he chose one of the busiest days of the year to get us to fill out the technical stuff. We're like, Kevin, we're up all night, we're doing these things, we have this deadline, we don't, it's just, just it's due tomorrow, just fill out these things and, and, and be done with it. God, fine, all right, so, you know, we'll, I'll stay up the floor instead of three that night, whatever we were doing. And that was in March, and I remember this vividly because I'm always searching for speech on the web, seeing, you know, what trends are happening, what people are saying about us, and uh, that's how we found out what movies are as well. And I saw somebody had tweeted, 13 period, uh, digital vegetation and rendering technology submitted by speed dreams. Like, what the world is that? Go to the guy's Twitter account and I see that he's got this numbered list. And go back enough tweets, it is technology is under consideration for a Technical Academy Award at next year's Oscars. This was in August. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I said, what does that mean? We're under consideration. I had no idea what that meant. You know, I didn't know that this was something they did. So I go back and I look and I, and I look for last year and there are 15 technologies last year that were listed as under consideration, and when the winners were announced last year, 13 of those were awarded. I'm like, oh God, we've got a really good chance of winning. This is amazing. Oh wow, that's like an 85% chance. So you know, we're all hooting and hollering, and at the bottom of the thing it says, if you have seen or you know any, you know, any other work in these subjects, some of the subjects were like, you know, camera lenses or, or you know, ex extended, you know, trolleys or whatever. It's not just software. And we said. Okay, and then at the bottom, if you know of any other technology that you know, works in these areas, let us know and we'll consider them too. So we had this digital vegetation submitted by Speedtree, created this category just for us. And the categories change every year, so that's not a big deal. And so we were like, nobody say anything for two weeks. We don't want our competitors coming to our site and seeing what we're doing, and so they submit their stuff. Everybody, radio silence. So a couple of months go by, and they're like, all right, you are on the finalists. We need to fly you out to Hollywood or Beverly Hills, and you're going to give a rigorous defense of your technology. You're going to give five minutes in front of the entire academy, as is everybody who's nominated, and then we're going to spend two hours. We're going to do a deep dive with the technical committee and then numerous follow-up phone calls. A deep dive on um, digital okay. vegetation. Yes, on yeah. our technology exactly. How did you do this? What did you, when did you do it? Those kind of things. And so we had to really show it, you know, how it's going to work. So we flew out to Hollywood, and they said, "Oh, by the way, you know, when you get here." Here are the people being considered for a, a technical company work for digital vegetation. And it said Speechery, DreamWorks, Disney, Weta Digital, who did Lord of the Rings and the Planet of the Apes movies and the Hobbit movies, and then another company in Europe that was similar to ours. And, well, that's it. It was a fun <laughs> ride. Man. That was so much fun. That was, you know, so at least we can say we were nominated, right? You know, we always put our acceptance speech back in our pocket and just go back our way. And so we, we get there, and, and it turns out we didn't tell anybody. How did they find out? Oh, well, the Academy has this extensive network, and we push out, and we try to find everybody that, that could have done it. And so we get there. We're scared to death. We have no idea where we're going. Everybody in the room seems to know each other because they're all from these companies, right? And, and this is all the technologies. There was, there was 80 uh, technologies represented, and only 20 ended up winning. Um, and so everybody knew each other because they all you know, traded places and worked here and worked there. And you know, Michael and I were just like, we don't know anybody. Um, and so when we did our five minute thing, we got to meet Richard Edlund, which was a really big deal. He, he, uh, he's won four Oscars for visual effects, and he started with Star Wars, so in Ghostbusters he won 40, all the Star Wars movies, Indiana Jones. Uh, and he was running the, the technical group, so we got to meet him, and he, he liked our presentation. Um, so and we did our deep dive, and you know, we had lots of phone calls, and then, you know, they were very, very vigorous about, okay, what did you do exactly? Do you deserve to be on this award? Prove that we did what you did. And so we're just like, oh wow, they are serious about this. And so, uh, then we just waited with bated breath, of, you know, who was going to win, who was going to win, and we, you know, we, we knew that they had announced on January 7th, the year before, and it, January 7th came and nothing, 8th came, nothing, 9th, 10th, and I'm like, when are they going to announce? The actual ceremony is in like two and a half weeks, we've got tuxes to buy and all that if we won. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we was waiting and waiting for it, and then finally it was announced that um, uh, speech tree won uh, for a digital vegetation and dream, and, and they told us all of you could win or none of you could win. This is not a competition. Um, and then DreamWorks was also named um, for digital vegetation, and their focus has always been, as you know, uh, animated movies. So Shrek and, right. and um, Madagascar and all that stuff. So ours were photo real. 
Um, their focus was on animation, and, and we both ended up winning. So um, we, we count ourselves lucky. We were very much. Too so you're good. not that special because the DreamWorks is DreamWorks one. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> exactly right. Keep so my head keep small. That's right. And so you know that that, um, that you know, David. We were very much David and not David and Goliath uh, scenario. So that, that that's a great story, and that's sort of the that's sort of the that's sort of the we framed now the beginning, which was uh, Lexington High School, and we framed the end, which was. Um, Standing up on stage with DreamWorks and other folks winning your Academy Award. I'd like to take it, take it back now a little bit and talk about how you got from where you started to where you are today. Um, so talk talk a little bit about, you, you talked a little bit about IDV starting off uh, as data visualization and then migrating into SpeedTree over the course of a decade. Can you talk a little bit about some of the trials you had as you were uh, moving your company through the early stages of the growth? Absolutely. Um, there's a, a, a few stories I want to pick one that, that works, and especially in our early days. It was, it was just Michael and me. Kevin, I think, might even have been part-time when he started, and we had one other engineer, and we wanted to go after SBIR money. And I know that's a big deal in the startup community in Columbia, and it should be. It's, it, you know, if you just, um, you, you go and look at the topics the government wants you covered, and, and you can go and apply anything you want to do. Say, I, I think I can do this, and here's how I would do it. And they decide whether you get the money or not. So that was huge for us. We had a small contract that was running out, and SpeedTree hadn't taken off yet, and we needed this money. So we put in a proposal, and we won a phase one award with uh, the Navy, but the specific organization that we had was called uh, Joint Warfare Analysis Center, or JWAC is what they went by. JWAC. Who had been a black box organization, or a black, black you know, organization before, uh, maybe only a few years before, so they didn't even exist technically uh, a few years before they awarded that to us. And they were interested in digital vegetation no, solutions? No, surprisingly <laughs> not, in DOD. Um, so uh, they were very interested in um, visualizing network simulations that they had done. And they did not have skills in visualization, but they knew they wanted that. So we came out there and we did our phase one thing and we showed them what we did and we, we showed a lot of visualizations that were small in scale. Uh, you know, cars or motors or whatever we had that like, here's how the data works and flows through the stuff that we've done at, at College of Engineering. And they're like, no, 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 we, we focus on large scale things. We, you know, we want global maps or US maps and show them. We're like, it's all the same to us. It's just data coming in and making pictures. We can do that. And so we put together this, uh, Michael and I really worked on, uh, and Greg Croft uh, worked on this uh, simulation um, where we did this mock FedEx shipping stuff where you know, things were being shipped over the US. And as a simulation running, we visualized what would happen if you would disable different routes, or different disabled cities or whatnot to show them, this is how we would do it. We don't know what you do, but here's what our make-believe network looks like, because it was very hush-hush, top secret stuff, we couldn't see what we did. And so they were like, all right, we'll come to the phase one meeting, and this was very much like the Academy Awards. You may, we were, there were four other winners of phase one. I'm fascinated to hear the, how like this is the like, okay. like Academy Awards. Well, because we were competing against four other phase one winners. Uh, that DreamWorks, and, Disney. Yes, amazing <laughs> enough, they also cut their teeth on DOD. Uh, so we go into this room and we have our stuff ready. And they said, well, it's not a competition. You may all get phase twos or none of you, just like they said. Just like they okay, there we go. And they had told us that up to the meeting. And so we walk in to this you know, very intimidating room with people's very important jobs uh, who are looking to, to, to fund us for phase two. Well, phase two is $700,000, right? And we only had 70, so that was company-changing revenue for us. And we're like, wow, we really want this, even if it was over two years. And so they said, all right, what you say and do for the next 30 minutes will determine whether you get $700,000. I mean, just sink down your seat. Oh, God, the, you know, the pressure was just enormous. And Michael and I looked at So this is easy for you right now, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so easy now, right? So we're just like, oh, my God. It was, I mean, it would make or break our company at that time. So we gave our demo, it turned out one of the companies was composed of five MIT graduates from engineering school. Like, oh, that's it, you know, we're done. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, what, what chance did the, you know, the USC engineers have? But we ended up winning phase two, we went phase three with this organization. We, we worked with that organization for probably seven or eight years um, through multiple phase threes. We even got out of the SBR program and just did direct contracts with them for a while. So, um, and we actually launched a product um, from all that technology that was not successful, but um, they used it for years there. Not successful, but they used it for years. They used it there. But oh, we okay. were not commercially successful outside of the organization. So you, uh, so you did a lot. That sounds like bootstrapping. You did a lot of bootstrapping contract work we through did. the early stages of the company. That's right. All right. And then you migrated towards uh, speech. So tell us about some other. So that was a make it or break it for the company. In some ways, you had a half hour window to uh, get that get that phase two award or not. I suppose if not, you would have, we would be talking about you making some other kind of software today. Absolutely. Um, this was, uh, 
you know, we created Speedtree uh, by an opportunity we had. Somebody wanted us to visualize um, a new development in downtown Columbia, and they said, you know, the, the trees have to look a certain way. I have, I have to be able to recognize the species, and they need to be windblown and all that stuff. So just do it. And we looked at the software that was available, and there was nothing there. This was in 2001, and so. I, you know, and I have to hand it to Michael Speechery was his idea. He was like, I'm going to go tinker together something that makes trees. And I was like, Michael, we actually have work to do. I'm going to do all the work while you go into <laughs> with, with this tree thing. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. He's like, no, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can't knock something together. Um, and so long story short, we produced an animation uh, in, in a program called 3ds Max to be able to do it. And we said, well, we want to be able to um, sell this thing. So we, you know, we learned through our uh, engineering education through a professor named Bob Pettis, uh, who was my mentor in, in college engineering, that to take something from what's called a garage program, which means it works sometimes when I run it, and it, you know, I know how to work it, but nobody else does, to, to make it a finished product takes 10 times the effort that you put into creating the program to begin with. So we very much learned that curve, or that, 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 that relationship. So we're going to make this thing, we called it Speedtree Max, because it ran inside Max, and it sold okay. Uh, nothing that was earth shattering is maybe 10% of our revenue. And we said, we have this tree editor now, and you, and you guys saw that tree editor running. We have this tree editor now, and it works inside the Max. What if we exported those same trees into video games? And that was our thing. We loved real time graphics. Like, what if we put these in there and the wind blew? And, well, that's a lot harder to do than just animations are going to render overnight. This has to render in 30 milliseconds. You have to have trees everywhere. You have to you know, blow in the wind. And we said, all right, well, let's just go on to this website called OpenGL.org, which was a big tech website, and let's tell them we've got a real-time version of Speechery, even though we really don't. Let's see, let's see what happens. I don't think anyone in the audience knows what you're talking about. That's not a technique that any startup people use. No, no, not at all. Everybody's completely finished with their technology before they launch it, right? Okay. So we just said, let's just do that. Well, we got a call from a company called NVIDIA. Um, and that's oh, a small you, company. I heard of them. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, you know, Some engineers in the audience recognize It's like, what, a four, <laughs> four, four billion dollar company, and they're one of the leading graphics card manufacturers, and they're really big into, we need content that show off our cards, right? And so they called us and said, we see this OpenGL speed tree thing that you've got. We want sorry, to I'm sorry to interrupt your story. So the, for those of you who aren't engineers, and video makes sorry. graphics cards, the really fast graphics rendering. So yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So if you ever played any kind of 3D video game, actually, uh, NVIDIA's competitor, ATI, makes the graphics cards that fit inside the PS4, the Xbox One, or what have you. So it's very similar technology. And they said, well, we have this new technology coming out, and we want you to use it to create a demo with all these trees in it, and um, in return, we'll promote your technology. And I said, That's great. So we don't have anything. And I said, well, <laughs> what kind of demo could you recreate? Well, well, we have the technology, but we don't really have the demo that you might want. And I said, well, that's fine. We want you to use this tool to make your demo. So we bought some time that way. And so we created this demo where you were flying through a forest and some different things were going on. And we sent it to them. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is great. And I said, like, this is terrible. You need to do this again. <laughs> and we were like, really, God, that's awful. And they said, well, we can't show this to our customers. You need to go use it. So we worked with them like, what elements do you want to? Well, why don't you put a, you know, a mechanized warrior in the middle of the forest and have some action and, and change the lighting and all these things. And so we spent that entire summer putting this demo together. And it was huge for us. And we learned so much about the rigors and challenges involved in getting digital vegetation to run in real time. This is where the product was really born. Um, and so we, uh, we submitted that to them. And said, OK, this is what we'll use. And they put it, oh, actually it was on our server, which we were selling with the uh, saving, uh, sharing rather, with the, uh, with the other incubator companies. So there were like eight incubator companies on this little 286 PC in the corner that we hosted this demo on. And it was like, you know, back in the day, 40 meg download in 2001. There's was, some incubator uh, companies in here that are getting some ideas. Yeah, <laughs> and so we were sharing it. And so, so when NVIDIA put this big page on their developer site and said, Check out this great stuff. This is a new startup using our stuff. Look how great it looks. And they linked to our server, which promptly burned to the ground. <laughs> it was literally a fire in the corner of the office. And we're just like, this is not going to work. Would you please host this for us in video? Well, why didn't you ask us that? Well, we didn't know the amount of traffic that you were going to be sending us. And it turns out 30,000 people downloaded it. But it wasn't just Game Boys or enthusiasts. It was real game developers looking at this. And so, um, we started getting calls the very next day, and one of the calls that we got was from a fellow named Todd Howard, who was working on Elder Scrolls for Oblivion, which turned out to be our, one of the most important game titles we've ever been in. He bought our first license in 2002, did not release until 2006, 
So that was a very, very long time. And we said, Todd, we don't have pricing for this yet. What would you pay for it? <laughs> and he's just like, he was very sat down with us and said, well, this is what other middleware costs. This is what its value is to me. So he gave us a range and we ended up using a number within that range. And so that's an interesting technique. I don't think yeah. I've ever used that one. <laughs> <laughs> we were two engineers, had no idea what yeah. we were doing. I mean, none. And, and it turns out, Pricing is one of our biggest challenges. I mean, we, well, we that would be that, a, there'd be a challenge yeah. that your approach might be a little. Uh, <laughs> right, right. But I can see where it would be a challenge. I, I should say that's not our only data point. There was other middleware in the space that did physics or, or other you know effects, and they were all all in that you know five to to ten thousand dollar range. And ended up pricing ours at six thousand uh, dollars per game per platform at that time. So. Uh, Nvidia calling. Can we get discounted for USC uh, alumni? Oh, why not? You can actually buy it for 19 bucks a month right now. Uh, it's a subscription version. It's not, it's not the full version that those guys got, but um, you know, reaching out to Indies is, is pretty important to us now. It's a new direction for us. Uh, but uh, you know, Nvidia was without them, it would have taken us so much longer to get on the map. And, I, and we and we do, you know, we talk around high schools and that kind of thing, and people are like. What do you owe your success to? And I'm like, many, many, many failures, right? I mean, we, we tried so many things that did not work for us during the, with, with the money that we were earning. We don't call it failing, we call it pivoting. That's right. <laughs> we also call it learning by our mistakes, right? So we did that as well. And so the other seven, the other seven uh, companies in the incubator that were sharing that server with you, did they come after you at all or get upset with you? Yeah, you know, I don't know. We never heard from them. But I do yeah. think that the incubator now has much stronger server support than this. <laughs> I hope so. And it's a lot cheaper to do these days in the fast forward fourteen years. But, um, so that was a make it or break it that really went in your in the right direction for you, no question about it. Absolutely. And we would um, we'd be sunk without them. And like I said, we would we would have had to they, they just put they lit our fuse, right? They, they put us in front of the world that who knows where we'd be if they hadn't been able to provide that kind of acceleration. So that, that was it. That's great. And then uh, and so let, let me ask you about the team because you you mentioned all of your team members, many of whom are here, and uh, and and some of whom got a chance to share the stage with you um, at the Oscars with, with winning an Academy Award with you. So how did you put this team together? How did you end up partnering up with Michael uh, Seacrest? That's a good question. Um, my passion when I was in graduate school was real-time graphics, right? And back in the day, in the, in the mid to late 90s, there was only one name in that game, and it was Silicon Graphics. And those were uh, very expensive computers, you know, starting at twenty and thirty thousand dollars, going all the way up to several million dollars. Uh, that would do the three D graphics that we see today on PCs. Not quite as strong, but you know, these were huge machines that ran Unix. And I loved them, and I convinced a lot of professors to spend a lot of money on those. And I lived at those machines. I couldn't wait to get them to work. I'm talking about your human partners. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> so. I'm in graduate school, in walks Michael Seacrest with my advisor who's trying to recruit him to come to our group. And Michael's being, you know, Michael was the number one student uh, undergrad that, uh, for, uh, for his class, and you know, he was just highly sought after everywhere. And, and my professor, uh, Bob Pettis, was like, show him the, the cool stuff and, and we'll hook him. It works, right? So I was like, here's all this graphic and this graphic, and I wrote this and look at this other thing. And Michael's like, I have to do this right now. And so he did, and uh, you know, my professor taught me everything. I passed everything I knew on to Michael. Uh, we worked so well together from the media. I don't think we've really ever had any sort of deep argument about anything in the 15 years we've had the business. And, we, and we, from the beginning, we worked really, really well before we even had the business. We were working for professors, uh, Roger Dougal and Bob Pettis. Um, and we just had the idea, let's, let's start a company. And uh, because the incubator had just created, we're like, wow, you mean USC actually would encourage us to create a company, not frown on it? And we thought academia would, would frown on that for whatever reason. And now it's a huge deal, right? That's all you hear about. Go make a company. Go, 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 go do it. Uh, so we're like, oh, okay, we'll try to do that. We'll do this interactive data stuff that we do for, that we do now, uh, you know, because we were full-time employees of the university at that time after graduate school. And um, so once we did, we, we brought an engineer that was in our group along with us. He was several years behind us. Hired another engineer from that group later. Uh, Kevin came calling. Do you guys need any marketing? Um, I've got an MBA from Carolina. We said, sure, we need some of that. Come on, come on aboard. And uh, of course, we haven't let him go since because he was really, really, really good at it. Um, and then, you know, we actually uh, brought a staff artist. That was one of the crucial decisions we made. Is everything we've done is the, the term is programmer art, right? Meaning we're not artists, but we're going to try to be artists, and it's terrible and it's really, really awful. So we bring in artists from from the. Uh, Art department at Carolina. We had an internship program where they came in by the dozens, and one of them, uh, by the name of Steve Pipowitz, was so much more talented than the rest. We, we, you're at your feet. You're not leaving. 
we're going to bring you on full time. And so he worked for us for eight years after that out of college. So now we actually have uh, uh, two other artists. Uh, Steve went on, by the way, to work for Digital Domain. He works for Bungie uh, now. So he's had a very successful career. Um, and so now we have uh, a couple of artists um, from, that actually graduated from SCAD. But so would you say that one of the keys to your success has been to hire people from USC? Is absolutely. That sort of, yeah. Absolutely. We, we're, really we're, we're firm believers in USC. That. That and they good. supported us. And this is one story that I didn't get to tell. Another make it or break it moment was. Go ahead and tell it. Go ahead. Um, on, you know, I'm sure that's what I'm really uh, <laughs> So, um, from graduate school, we were hired full time by the university. Um, I was still kind of tinkering around with the PhD, but they're like, we want you to be full time research engineers. We have all these millions of dollars coming in. We want you to do the research and the programming. We want you to teach classes while you're here. So, we did that for a few years. Um, and then we got this idea to create a company. I'm like, what are we going to use for money? We have, we have no idea what we're going to use. And so, we went to <coughs> Professor Roger Dougal, who was the one. Controlling the millions of dollars coming in. Everyone's listening very closely right That's now. Right. They want to see the answer to this question. Uh, we said, Dr. Dougal, um, we're thinking about starting a, a high tech company that does pretty much what we do for you now. What do you think about writing us a subcontract to do exactly what we're doing for you now, but as a corporate entity? And he finds very thoughtful. Huh? Do I think that South Carolina could use another insurance company, another tobacco company, or do I think that they could benefit from a high-tech startup? Yes, I think I want to see South Carolina dig into this. I will write that contract for you. Not all, not all professors can write contracts for all startups, just to be clear. <laughs> yes, that's right. But you have like three a year that you can write, right? <laughs> Who's asking the question? <laughs> Are we running short on time? Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, and, and he did it, and Roger Dougal was one of the people we thanked when we got our Academy Award. But without him, uh, we would not have been where we were. Uh, that is exactly how we started the company, and during, it was a three-year contract, and it was for minus money, but it was enough for Michael and me to make a living um, at about what we had been making at USC, um, not quite as much, um, and, but enough to bring on a couple more part-time people and, and experiment with stuff. You know, so, All right, Roger, you just bought 75% of our time. But with this 25 percent we're going to try a bunch of stuff that none of it worked I mean, it was it was years in before our speech we finally took hold a lot of things that we tried just absolutely failed and when we give talks around one of the things that i try to emphasize is people are you're lucky, you're lucky. I say, no no let's not call it luck luck equals preparation times opportunity if preparation is zero you've got no luck if opportunity is zero you've got no luck and so you really need to raise both of those up so um, when we went to the sbar thing remember they said 30 minutes seven hundred thousand dollars our preparation bar was through the roof. We had stayed up all night, day after day after day. We were going to, we are not going to get out work. We're going to have the best possible demo that we can have. The opportunity just fell in our lap. We had no idea that you know, there was that much money at stake, whether they were going to do it right then. So preparation um, has been a big part of our success. That said, we have scars for lots of preparation for things that didn't work, uh, but we grew from that and, and, and honed our skills there again. That's a that's a great story. So you you know, as I was listening to you talk about the team, um, the uh, make it or break it opportunities, which actually happened throughout the course of over a decade, right? It yes, sounds absolutely. Like. And um, and then talking about your perseverance and uh, and your pivots, not your failures. Um, <laughs> it's been a great it's great been great listening to you. I don't know, um, is it where's uh, Laura? Am I allowed to take a question from the audience, Laura? I don't see her here. Uh, are there any questions from the audience for Chris? We'll open it up a little bit. So one, first off, thank you for speaking this time. Sure. Um, what, what do you consider your biggest failure and how has that shaped your success at the IRAC? Oh gosh, the, the, the absolute biggest failure, and it's, and it's a gorilla, is the technology that we had the SBIR money to develop. Um, they gave us um, hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop that technology, and we poured hundreds of thousands of dollars of our own money into that technology. And, and the, the entire application was designed to bring data in and visualize it in certain ways, and you had a lot of control over how that was done, and it was revolutionary. We were like, this is the coolest software of all time. I can't believe. Look at this. They loved it. We loved it. They had a topic about it. It had to be something that people would, would use. Um, and we sold it from the time we sold it to Rolls Royce. We sold it to, to Northrop Grumman. We had a few customers. But we never had enough to, to warrant the time and effort that we sunk into it. And I'll talk about this, the scars of preparation. The amount of time we poured into that, and Speechery had succeeded as a game product at that time, and we and we let it go. It just started to get old and stale, old and stale. While we worked on this future product called ISIS, is what we called it. Uh, I spelled E Y E dash S Y S. Need to make that clear. 
Um, and the, the biggest lesson we learned from that is we held on to it just way too long. We just, we just, it's going to succeed. It's going to succeed. It has to. It has to. Look how great this is. And it really, we feel like some of the problem was the product was ahead of its time. The product was hard to use for people who weren't hardcore into visualization like we were. Um, and so we finally did let it go, and we, we poured our heart and soul back into speed tree. And that's actually when we started focusing on the cinematic version. Uh, and I'm sorry, and one more, one more make it or break it. All right, I'm going to do this because this kind of ties into that time. We let go of ISIS and we, we kind of cornered the market on, on speed tree vegetation for games and we said, you know, movies need trees too. And when you sell just trees, you've got to find any place you can to put them here. What about like model trains? You know, what are, what are we going to do? Movies need trees. So we decided um, that we were going to modify our software to make it much more artist friendly, art directable. It had not been nearly as much that way. And so um, Michael led the charge on this, and we went and interviewed a bunch of visual effects artists to say, what do you want to see Speed Tree do? Because people that did move had come and they evaluated it and said, this is lacking, this is not what I need, it needs these features. And so we actually started the software over. We just lit, you know, set a fire what we had and, and, and started again, so that was much more art directable like you saw in the video um, earlier tonight. And so, I mean, we barely have it together with Speed Tree version 5, I mean, that number will be tattooed in my brain forever. And all this new stuff, it was just barely high to heartbeat and the phone rang. It was Industrial Light and Magic, which is the visual, biggest visual effects firm in the world. And this was the summer, early summer of 2009. And they said, we hear you do trees. We want to take a look for some little movie that we're doing. And we're like, oh God, you know, this stuff is just not ready. It's just not ready. But this was preparation times opportunity, right? We did not have the preparation done, but this was the opportunity was not coming again. We said, what do we give them? Do we give them the stable old stuff or do we give them the really unstable new stuff? And we actually put it to them, what do you want to use? And they're like, oh, hell, give us the new stuff. Our stuff crashes all day, every day. Just, that, is, that, is, that is where we live, man. We're on the bleeding edge. Send it over. And we said, really? I mean, this was, we were beginning to really learn because that's not how the game community, they wanted something polished. These guys were ready for the, for the stuff. And then we only had it on Windows, but they only ran Linux. They went and bought Windows systems in just to test the software. And so thus began a relationship. So here we are, we know games, we don't know the film industry at all. And boy, that was the summer of learning from the fire hose, right? I mean, it was just right in our face, as much information as we could possibly take in. And we're like, okay, what else can you tell us? What else can you tell us? And they were giving us concept art of this film. And our artist, Steve Kukowitz, was helping them as hard as he could to try to match it. Okay, this is what I think you do. But he was learning the software too, because it was brand new. It was a whole, whole new approach for us. And so we worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and, and they used it. And actually, if you go to our, if you go to speechtree.com slash avatar, you'll see this whole kind of a bit of the story here. And so they never were allowed to tell us what film they were working on because they were under confidentiality calls for the people who had employed them to do it. And so when their trailer for Avatar came out a few months before that Christmas, they said, you may or may not see your stuff in a trailer that may or may not kind of come out today. I hung up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, what trailers came out today? Go find, find, find. Well, this is a little film called Avatar. What the hell is Avatar? It's got these blue people. You know, we didn't know. We had no idea. You didn't know it was going to be the highest grossing film of all time. It was just this trailer with blue people running around the forest is all we knew. The very first shot was, in the trailer, was flying over the jungle of Pandora. And our artist, Steve, was like, that's my tree right there in the middle. That's the palm tree. I made that for them. And we're like, oh my God, it's actually in this trailer. It was such a huge leap for us from video games to you know, world-class visual effects. And in a way that we could never do, right? You give these tools to people that make world class visual effects, and your trees are going to look better than they've ever looked. Oh my God, look what these guys have done with this. I mean, you know, you can make hammers all day long, but if you're not a carpenter, there's only so much you can do with it. And so we were blown away by what we've done. It turns out that Wedded Digital, who was one of the people we were competing against uh, for the vegetation many years later, um, was digital vegetation solutions. Solutions, absolutely, because you know we don't want to leave you without you know answers to your problems. Yes. Uh, and so. The um, Weta had led on the visual effects for Avatar, so was, most of the movie is theirs. But ILM was brought in because Weta was not going to make the Christmas 2009 deadline. So ILM was like, we've only got six months to do like 15 to 20 percent of the shots, and there's a crap load of vegetation in here. How are we going to do it? And that's when we got the phone call. So people often mistake that all of the vegetation in Avatar was ours, but it was only the stuff that ILM did. Uh, Weta had their own solution, which was up for the Academy Award later on. So. Um, that was crucial for us. Another effect for you, looking back at the attack, uh, uh, attack aircraft, 
shooting at them. Those are the ones that ILM did, and that's how amazing it is to me that these companies can work so seamlessly together. That you can, the camera looks this way is one company, the camera looks that way is another company in the same scene. Uh, so uh, that was huge for us, and we're like, this is it. Oh my God, this is fantastic. This movie's going gangbusters. We're, you know, this is we're gonna we're gonna do the movie business. 2009, that was our only movie. 2010, not a single film used speech. Or God, we're going, the one hit wonders, right? We'll never do this again. And we just kept pressing and pressing and pressing. Um, and then ILM started using it regularly. Uh, and then some other people have picked it up. And so, like I said, we've got maybe 25 major visual effects companies are now customers of ours or clients of ours. And um, we're, we're in 44 films. And we don't always know the films that we're in. We just found out that, that Birdman is, is one of the films that, that the speech was in. Didn't know it before the Oscars, but we knew it after. Uh, and like that information could have come in handy with our promotions leading up to the Oscars, but you know, so be it. Um, but anyway, sorry, that's a very, very long story, but it reminded me of the Avatar story, which is one of my favorite war stories to tell. Question, if the question back. Speed Tree is uh, impressive technology, and you guys obviously did a good job. Do you consider Speed Tree a finished product where you guys still have the enhancements to it? Uh, thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Uh, it's not even remotely finished. It's never been finished. You know, it's just we just we just we quit and release what's there and make sure it's stable and then we move on to the next version immediately. And we do that across the board. And just like you know, we had so much success in games, but it wasn't working in the movie industry because of the way we chose to design it. And we just said, if we're gonna if we're gonna grow, we have to we have to break this. Right? We have to make our I mean, we have to break these eggs. And that's what we chose to do. And we're, we we come back from trade shows all the time where we have the world's best visual effects artists, the world's best video game programmers coming to us going, you know, you really should be doing this differently or you need to do that differently. And, and engineers have one of two reactions to criticism. Leave me alone, I'm gonna do it my own way, I know what I'm doing. Or I really would like to sell a lot more of this. This guy has tremendous experience in this. He's being honest with me about what it does and doesn't do well. I'm going to listen to that. So we tried to have thick skins as much as we possibly could uh, during that process, and so it's never going to be finished. It will only be finished when Michael or I are dead. <laughs> or retired. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, from what I understand, you initially got some type of funding from SBIR, and when I looked at the certain categories that they do provide funding for, um, not, not a lot of them are for technology. So, how did you translate from getting funding from SBIR to having a self sustained speed tree? Well, it was SBIR went on for us for quite some time. We were extremely lucky that the that the topic that they uh, released was right in our wheelhouse. We couldn't believe our luck, and we tried to shoehorn that same proposal into like NASA had one that was kind of similar. We would write that same proposal and send it to them and send it here. So we got rejected, but the very first one that we ever tried was that one. And you're right, a lot of them do not line up, and you kind of have to wait. And they release topics what three or four times a year. I'm not sure. And you just have to look and look and look. Sometimes they already have companies in mind that they want to give those contracts to, and sometimes, um, sometimes not. But uh, I, I wish I could give you better advice about how you're going to line up with what you want to do. Um, if we wanted to do virtual vegetation, I promise you that topic was never going to come along. <laughs> Even from the Forestry Commission, I mean, it just wasn't going to come. Uh, but the uh, how we made the, the transition was we pushed and pushed that SBAR. We, we we built that relationship with that organization. And we made ourselves invaluable to them, right? They couldn't do without us. And when employees come on to me and I tell them, you know what you need to do to keep this job, and what? I said, make it extremely painful for me to let you go. Make it that you are so valuable to me that I can't imagine running this company without you. That's all you got to do, right? Just, <laughs> just be that guy, right? Or, or growl. Or, and, and so I give that speech every time. And, and so um, that's what we became to, to JWAC. And as we as we got that money, they, could, they, were, they were only paying for part of our time, so we always had a certain number of hours every year that we could spend, and we wanted to grow uh, speech. We actually did the very first version of speech before we ever won any SBIR, and then we used that money to, to fund it and fund it, and just kind of you know as the SBIR stuff started tanking, speech started ramping up, and then we just killed that so we could focus exclusively on speech tree. Never been interested in being a 50 or 100 person company. We're nine people right now. We're in 1,500 square feet. We have one person in Germany, one person in Los Angeles, and, and that's it. And that's, that's kind of how we like to operate. Now I'll ask you my next question. When did you know you know, start growing your company, or at what point did you start? Um, well, I, 
one of the most crucial hires that we made was that artist that I was talking about, the graphic artist, because everything we had done, you know, used, in the Michael's Academy Award acceptance speech, he held up a picture that he took of a bush, right, because he needed that texture to put in the, the, one of the first things he made. That, actually, that picture is in a video game called Project Gotham Racing 3, which was one of the first Xbox 360 games. That was the launch title for that platform. Um, and so he's like, I can't, I can't write this program and do the art at the same time, and plus my art is terrible. I mean, we need to get somebody who really knows what they're doing. And so that was the most crucial hire technologically that we had. Um, recognizing that we could not do the marketing and sales was a big part of it, so Ke bringing Kevin Meredith was on. All right, Kevin, here's the stuff. Go sell, go market, go promote while we focus on the software because engineers tend to want to do everything themselves. They're very exacting. They're very, um, uh, what's the word I want to use there? Exactly. That's right. We're doing yourself. Well, I want it done this way, and I can't. You know, delegating is really hard for me, even to this day. I want it done a certain way. Um, from Michael, not so much, but you know. Uh, so bringing on the support system outside of programming. All right, the business guy, the art people, the administration. So you know, at, the administration was a big. Uh, you know, we had to hire an office manager because when you go into phase two SBIR, they make you change your accounting system, and it's a nightmare. I mean, it really is. So phase two is the you know, be careful what you wish for. Uh, for SBIR, um, but anyway, we haven't hired enough for me to be able to say exactly how that comes about us. We just hired uh, a fellow named Danny Oaks, who is our digital, uh, uh, you know, digital marketing manager, our social media manager, um, and uh, we, we put that job description out. It was a lot of fun. We said we need somebody who's hardcore in the games, which was like what? You know, it makes no sense. How, how, you know, so we need somebody who's hardcore in the games, but understands how to promote, how to write. Uh, writing was a really part, strong part of it. So. Um, that was, that was a hard combination to find people who were really into games and knew how to manage social media, but we were, we were very lucky to have Danny. And he's going to start full time for us Monday, and we're going to the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. So he's going to get invited to the Xbox party and the PlayStation party out there. So he's, he's in hog heaven now. <laughs> it, it beats the crap out of his last job, so I'm told. So uh, we're running a little short on time. I, I just want to, I do want to ask, um, you know, the obvious question. So you've been very successful. Lots of us are listening to your story uh, with some envy, uh, although some of the, some of the parts, some of, the, some of the rides you're, uh, you're, you're uh, describing uh, had my heart palpitating a little bit, so I'm not sure if I want to go through a whole journey, but um, give us some advice uh, you know, holistically. We want to replicate what you've done and, and sort of go through that journey uh, for the folks who are just starting companies now in the audience. What, what's the best advice you can give uh, to help, help them think about how to grow their businesses overall? That's a great question. Unfortunately, I've only done this once, right? I'm not a serial entrepreneur. I don't have 30 businesses in my wake. Uh, I, I can only pull from my own experience of what I think led to whatever success we've had. And I think that the key ingredient was passion. Uh, we were extremely passionate about what we did. It was the kind of thing that we would have done whether we were paid to or not. Uh, we were both hardcore into games. We were both into the real-time programming and, and that kind of stuff. We really weren't into trees. That just kind of fell in our lap and we applied all of our skills to that. Um, uh, but it was that, that passion and that ability to go an extra mile. I talked about earlier, uh, this is specific to software, but it, about that 10 times leap you have to make from going from a garage program to a computing program. We, we very much believed in that, and we've seen a lot of people who didn't do that, um, who, who didn't complete things. I talked about luck equals preparation times opportunity. Um, if you want to succeed, you have to, you have, in my opinion, you, you never have to allow yourself to be outworked by your competition. Uh, provided that you're in a market where you even have competition, which we um, weren't for a while. Um, but if, if, but the other thing is with ISIS, the lesson I learned with ISIS is really, really be sure you have a market before you sink hundreds of thousands of dollars. Do not use anecdotal data, right? Well, this this organization put all this money into it, so it must be something that everybody can use, and uh, that's that's absolutely not the case. So, passion, hard work, you have to have the skills, and you have to. Recognize your weaknesses and fortify those with either educating yourselves or bringing in other people uh, to, to augment uh, where you may be, um, and which, which we learned the hard way. Kevin came on later than he should. Our staff artist uh, came on later than he should. Um, our office manager came on way later. So Kevin, God bless Kevin, he did our bills for us uh, before we ever even had an office manager. So um, yeah, I mean, we learned a lot of what you should not do. Um, so I wish I had more advice for you. I wish I had started 10 companies and I could tell you very fluidly uh, what you should do. But uh, my advice is limited to this one company. Well, that one company is a great company, Chris. Thank you very much Absolutely. for taking the time with us this evening.